There are no less than seven different ways that Cyberpunk 2077 can conclude, and whilst some share similarities and overlapping parts by which to get there, they mostly differ wildly. So in this video, we're taking a detailed look into the outcomes and consequences of all of them to answer the ultimate question, which is best. This is gonna be a wild ride, so let's get straight to it with the game's worst ending. The Devil, the only real available ending path when you haven't done any side questing. We get this one after Embers, up on the rooftop, by choosing the option Think Trusting Arasaka's Risky But Worth It, taking the Omega Blockers to silence Johnny before setting off to first rescue Hanako. Via a quick detour to the Arasaka residence alongside Anders Hellman and assisted by Takemura if we saved him during Search and Destroy. And say what you will about Takemura not being a true friend, that's a fair enough assessment, but saving him for this ending is absolutely absolutely worth it in my opinion, both for his aid in the smasher fights and the general extra interactions. Anyway, saving Hanako, we'll jump in a quick air uber direct to Arasaka Tower, with Hanako having hatched a plot to overthrow her kinslaying brother and reinstall the true leader of the Arasaka Empire, Saburo Arasaka, who, much like Johnny, of course has his own digital consciousness backup buried down in the Makoshi basement. So Hanako brings the ghost of her dad to the rainforest floor to scare the ever living crap out of the Saka board members and terrify them back into submission. However, Yorinobu has a couple final cards to play. Resorting to violence and slaughter to maintain his grip on the tyrannical megacorp, we not only have to fight flaws of his men to stop him, but also, finally, his ultimate bodyguard, Adam Smasher, in a unique arena different to any of the other endings, and one I'd say is a little more open and easy to fight him in. Despite his new Sandevistons and other buffs received in 2.1, it was still fairly easy easy to beat him using a Satara with the Wall Puncher mod and Neil to one-shot any other goons. Fun fights and something of a unique merit of this ending, to be fair. With him finally defeated though, we're brought face to face with the apparent big bad of this particular ending. With such a misconception, ladies and gentlemen, being reason one why the devil ending is the absolute worst. Bearing in mind the one after this is just straight up suicide. I've done a whole 36 minute video on just why Yorinobu is the hidden hero of this game so I'll be very brief here. This dude hates his father's company almost as much as Johnny, and he realized back in 2023 that if a nuke wasn't enough to bring it down, his only hope was to assume control and dismantle it from within. If planting bombs not enough, what can you do? You become bomb. When killing his father back at Kompeki, he was kickstarting a plan he'd long had in the works. And whilst the Burrow's intervention may not have been expected in that moment, Yorinobu wasted no time in quashing any resistance. The assassins sent to the junkyard weren't for us, but rather for Takamura, who of course is Saburo's personal bodyguard that would stop at nothing to attain vengeance. Oh, and Saburo was also toying with the idea of nuking Night City on his way there, so Yorinobu put a stop to that threat too. He's really not a bad guy. And had V not been so focused on survival, Johnny and Yorinobu could have made one hell of a destructive duo for Arasaka, as they still inadvertently can in alternative endings. But here, the worst case scenario happens, entirely enabled by us. We help Arasaka to regain its glory, deposing Yorinobu's coup and weakening him so completely that Hanako is able to slot Saburo's biochip into her brother's head, effectively killing him and restoring the consciousness of her father. You spend your whole life fighting something, only to become that very same thing, quite literally. Saburo, of course, plays it off that his son donated his body, returning the gift of life his father once gave him, and it really is a chilling prospect, suggesting Saburo will remain functionally immortal by continually body hopping through his heirs, forever ruled by a man unwavering in his World War II forged ideals. It's established in the tower ending of Phantom Liberty that by 2079, Yorinobu is still ousted by the Arasaka board, so suffice it to say his plan of total company destruction is not fully successful, likely to keep the Megacorp on the table for sequels, but even still, ensuring Saburo can't make a return is still no doubt a better outcome. And who knows, maybe in an ending where Makoshi is destroyed, Yorinobu is able to hold on a bit better. It's impossible to say currently. So that's the global aspect to this ending, and it alone is enough to merit it the worst, in my opinion. We're literally lulled with false promises into helping the bad guys win, or the closest we can get to bad guys, in this gritty, morally grey 
story. But there's more regarding what happens to V after. Everything we just did for Arasaka was of course done with the promise that they could save V's life. And we're blasted away to their space station to have Johnny cut out. Murdered, depending on whether you think he was alive to begin with. This results in major cognitive damage to us and a gruelingly repetitive series of challenges that we may or may not eventually complete. These include solving a 2x2 two two Rubik's Cube, which cracks open in a vision to reveal the devil tarot card. The most on-the-nose sign that we've chosen badly, signifying losing oneself and the entrapment of your soul under the promise of fame and fortune. Actually, the devil ending does need to be played at least once in order to complete your tarot collection. That is just something to bear in mind. We also play an association game, though our answers seem to have no grounding on later events, sadly. And there's a very obvious reference to Blade Runner here, with us being told a graphic and sad story about a mouse being killed in order to gauge our empathy. Say what you will about the implications of this ending, they are dire, but I've got to say, it is one of the most unique of the bunch. And everything that takes place up on this space station is detailed and brilliantly written, dehumanizing V, as we eventually descend into a montage of repetitive daily tests, reduced to nothing but an Arasaka lab rat, and just hammering home what a poor, freedom-destroying choice we've made. It's also one of the worst for tying up our relationships, in that we merely get phone calls with those closest to us, ranging from them being not too bothered to insisting we return to Earth at once. A far cry from the in-person encounters of the alternatives. Hell, Johnny even straight up says we made the wrong choice before he dies. Eventually, we receive a visit from Anders Hellman or Takamura if we saved him, which finally confirms the fruitlessness of our endeavors. The surgery did not help. You will be dead before winter. It's the same story with most of the endings, of course. Returning to how things were before just isn't on the table with this game. Wrong city, wrong people. But here, we are faced with a final choice. Return to Earth with the short time we have left, die for certain, but die free, at least, even after all the damage we've done. Or, alternatively, well, just listen to this bullshit. It is written here that you relinquish all rights, but do not worry. The law is simply behind the times, and Ingram is not legally a person. Yeah, if that doesn't stink to high heaven, then I don't know what does. We become locked away as another Arasaka engram, and whilst apparently this is a reward for our service, I have a different theory. Clearly, our unique set of skills were able to reshape the future of the entire Arasaka Corporation, no doubt therefore being pretty valuable. Saburo's engram even says so much back at Mikoshi if we ask him. <laughs> And I think it's probable that we would only be redeployed into the world temporarily at the behest of the company when they needed something done. Kind of like the plots of Altered Carbon. We become, for all intents and purposes, a slave and a tool to Arasaka, who again, thanks to us, is now more powerful than ever. We literally leave the world a darker place for having lived in it, with the open potential to make it yet darker still. There is a glimmer of hope in this final interaction with a security guard. What would you say to a person who walked right in to their greatest foe's jail to save their life. Hmm. I would say, all right, but do not forget the way home. But for me, this is immediately overtaken by V's dire facial expression. Not happy, not even neutral, just straight up negative. Truly the worst ending, and good luck changing my mind on that. Then again, you could argue that this is the worst ending, and in terms of game content, it easily is. The devil means the direst consequences for the world, but it is brilliantly constructed, and a painful but still enjoyable hour or so of gameplay. The path of least resistance, however, cuts us straight to black. It's dire, hopeless, and depressing on a far more personal level. Could also just put all this to rest, is the quote of the day with this one, with the excuse being we won't be putting anyone else in harm's way. Just a shame V didn't give it an extra four minutes consideration for Johnny to pipe up with the don't fear the reaper option, but we'll come back to that. For this one, Johnny sits beside us, and after a little heartfelt farewell, the camera pans back, a shot rings out, and silence. Cue credits and various heartbroken messages to hammer home just what this did to everyone around us. Victor and Misty are hurt, Judy, Mama Wells, and River are devastated, whilst Kerry and Pan Am are just straight up pissed. I place this above the devil ending since things will no doubt play out globally as 
as we see them in the tower ending of Phantom Liberty, Arasaka definitely remaining somewhat peaceful and weakened until at least 2079. But make no mistake, as a player, this is only worth experiencing as a morbid curiosity rather than any kind of canon ending. And I suppose serves more as a punishment for those who didn't side quest and don't want to sell their soul to Arasaka. It's kind of annoying, actually, that there's no option to just wait for Johnny to take over our body, because killing us both is needlessly spiteful against a guy who, granted, has made some poor choices, but for the most part has agreed to try and help us to his own expense. Like, Johnny dying to save V's life is one thing, but this is just wanton tragedy for both parties. The new ending, added by Phantom Liberty, was for a long time highly anticipated. It prompted questions like, will there finally be a way to save V? Will this become the quote-unquote canon ending? And whilst yes, technically, this is the only ending wherein V definitely lives, it is far from a happy one, serving better as an expansion for the lore than a nice way to round off our protagonist's story. To unlock the tower, you'll first have to complete Phantom Liberty, of course, with only one ending from each Phantom Liberty ending path, leading us to this main ending. Basically, Somi needs returning to the NUSA for them to offer to help, which happens in the King of Swords and King of Pentacles endings. I've done a breakdown ranking like this for Phantom Liberty already, as well as a deep dive into all the hidden secrets of both ending paths, if you want to queue those up for once you're done here. Anyway, the tower is wildly different from any other ending, and can even be accessed without having to meet Hanako at Embers first, though granted it's still also an option after that. Reed will send an envoy to pick us up from the same decision-making rooftop, not even coming himself, and you should take that as the first warning sign. The NUSA, just like Arasaka really, don't care about us all that much, or if they do, it's our utility they care about, not our well-being. The whole sequence that follows is heartbreaking. Johnny explains that this is essentially death for him, again, same as the Arasaka ending, with both times the cost of our certain survival being his certain demise. And he pleads, not aggressively, but he he does politely plead, as anyone would when faced with certain death, that we please maybe find another way. No different really to what we've done ever since the heist. We of course do maintain the right to our body, but man, gotta feel sorry for the guy. And with a few quick, unassuming texts to our friends, which I'm sure won't come back to haunt us, it's on to our final heartfelt goodbye, which genuinely did make me tear up. Sometimes, you gotta let go. Just don't let anyone change who you are, okay? Johnny, I... Good night, Valerie. Today was a good day. See, at this moment, I thought back to what V said in Clouds way back when. And you must be... Valerie? V. Just V. Only people who know me real well can use my real name. Good night, Valerie. Today was a good day. Yeah, I'm not crying, you're crying. Look, I love this line so much that ever since September when I first played it, this is how I've been going to sleep at night. Hey Google, good night. Good night Sam, today was a good day, good night. It's actually a great way to reflect on the day, and I would highly recommend. Look, my point is, it's a memorable but emotional gut punch, this bit. A price hefty enough by itself to pay for our life. But of course, it's only the start. You were out for two years. It's 2079. Yes, of course, the surgery went wrong, sending us to sleep for two whole years. Now, I don't entirely buy the narrative that Reed spins to us, but for now, for this video at least, let's just assume it's the truth. Not only have we missed the last two years, but our body apparently no longer accepts implants. The David Martinez level of chrome tolerance is no longer something we can rely on, and returning to the life of Night City's most legendary merc is no longer on the table, an aspect we'll come back to. Arguably, the worst part of this entire ending, though, is the phone calls we make to our friends. What happened to River, Kerry, Judy, and Pan Am varies from great to terrible, but they all have one thing in common. They moved on, and now don't have time for us. The main relationships we went out of our way to build through this game do not stand the test of time. We lose pretty much everything we hold dear. First, our brother-in-arms, then our superpowers, let's be real, and now all of our best friends. I mean, 
Judy's married to someone else, and I am happy for her. So happy. I mean, Pan Am doesn't even answer. The only one who does, in fact, is Victor. And again, the string of phone calls oddly mirrors those from the devil ending, only with even sadder results. Returning to Night City, it then becomes clearer just why so many stories end at a certain point. Because what comes after can often be bitterly disappointing. We lose our apartment after falling behind on payments, and Delamain shares with us that info on Yorinobu that I mentioned previously. And when finally reaching Victor's, the place is barely recognisable. Gone is the character of Misty's esoterica, and the clinic has been entirely corporatized. No longer is Victor permitted to be the characterful dude that we know, instead moulded into a cog of Zeta Tech systems, serving just their employees and losing all his individuality. It's sad to know that this is what happens in the end, and I can only hope in some alternative endings we may be able to set some cash aside to hold this all back. Alas, Victor confirms our diagnosis, claiming we're now deaf to implants and cannot return to our normal life. We call him a sellout, and the meeting is prematurely ended by a demanding customer. This whole thing is designed to hammer home a hopeless feeling of rock bottom, and to literalise that, we're then floored down a flight of steps by just some random thug that even level 1v could have dealt with no problem. It's then that we see Misty, now sporting a different hairstyle and wearing Jackie's jacket. Our final conversation of the game, I'd say, is neither hopeless nor hopeful entirely, but rather it's an analysis of the ever-changing nature of life. Misty lost the esoterica, so now gets the opportunity to explore the world some more. As one door closes, another opens. It's a faces in the crowd thing. Might be our one privilege. And as nothing but a face in the crowd, V2 has options. Maybe not the same blaze of glory or friendship based ones that were fun for us the player to experience before, but as a person, V could become a fixer or an FIA analyst or an explorer. This chat with Misty then is a final reminder that whilst things may seem hopeless, there is now the open ended possibility for a fresh start. So as V wanders away as a face in the crowd with crappy clothes and not even any hair anymore, it's tough to keep feeling that sense of hope. We'll likely be settling down for the quiet life that Dex alluded to right at the beginning. And if we've learned one thing through all the gigs, shards and little encounters through this game, it's that life is pretty crap in 2077 when you're just a face in the crowd. And after everything V saw and did and was capable of doing, this just feels like the most backhanded reward ever. We did get our life, the one thing we couldn't have before Phantom Liberty, but what did it cost? everything. Worth playing for the expansion of lore? Absolutely. But then again, perhaps there's some things just best left as they were. Closing the book at a high point before things start to drop off. Look, it's not an entirely bad ending, it's just mostly that. So now we're on to the good endings, and these all overlap a little bit where multiple paths can lead to the same outcome because of the choice over who gets V's body. Whichever outcome is chosen here though, I think this is where the sun path belongs, given the existence of a similar but less upsetting alternative higher up. To get this one, of course, we want to take up on Johnny's offer to storm Arasaka Tower alongside Rogue, which is only unlocked if we do the chipping in and blistering love side quests for Johnny before heading to Embers. Think Hugh and Rogue should go kicks off the Johnny-centric ending, where with a quick word, the afterlife is closed and transformed into our war room. We possibly get an off-camera Rogue romance, and looking around her room afterwards, a little more character expansion. Clearly, she kept Johnny near and dear to her heart all these years, keeping a picture on her desk as well as one of Kerry, and also one of Mike Pondsmith? Indeed, this is either a portrait of the radio host Maximum Mike, voiced by Pondsmith, or the creator of Cyberpunk has subtly cast himself as the flagship character of Morgan Blackhand, who is weirdly absent from Johnny's memories of the tower bombing. This ending also acquaints us much better with Crispin Wayland, a completely underrated character in my opinion, possibly due to the fact that he's only really met by the fraction of players who complete this ending. Equally, The Sun is probably the best ending in terms of obtained gear. Probably. The full damage negating retro thruster boots are indeed cool, though we don't get to keep them afterwards. We do have 
however, get to keep Prejudice, one of the game's best assault rifles that I'll review and rank soon, and eventually Pride, the best and most powerful pistol in the game by my accounts, and one of my absolute favourite items to use. Though this video is more a story ranking, to which such things have a little sway. So, quickly running through Rogue's masterfully hatched plan, before a final lover's tiff with the third point of this triangle, Alt, things are ready to get moving. I love you. Rogue. Who is that? my son. Yeah, if you know what's coming, well, I guess the most tragic way to tear something down sometimes is to make us watch you build it up first. Despite Rogue's masterful plan, things do not of course go swimmingly from the off, and immediately begin with a crash landing into the Arasaka rainforest floor, which you'll recognize from the devil ending too. Whilst you're in here, do not miss the caretaker's spade found randomly in the trees somewhere near the conference table. It's a genuine crossover with the Witcher franchise, and restores health on knockdown for any heavy-hitting Berserk-style build. And of course, if you want some assistance for the Smasher fight, and to be a genuinely nice person, you'll make sure to save Wayland too, before moving on. It is possible not to do that. The fighting through the rest of this can be a challenge at first for the unspecced build, but once Alt is uploaded, there's not a lot left to do. Until, of course, we get to the final arena. That's right, the main reason I think this is the worst of the best endings is this little scene. Roll! Of course, this is what we have to do to acquire the Pride Pistol, but that's small consolation when Rogue's death could have been entirely avoided. Instead, we play a vengeful Johnny Silverhand, now warring against Smasher, who's just killed the woman he once loved. There is something, to be fair, that's satisfying here about fighting Smasher as Johnny, not V on his behalf, but to be honest, saying Silverhand sends his regards in any of the fights is a satisfying thing, which we'll come back to. This is also one of the ending paths by which to obtain the Judgment Tarot, though we can do that with any of the subsequent ones too. And just like all of them, we'll stumble towards Makoshi, plug ourselves in, only to then be told the harsh and difficult truth. V will die independent of what I do. This is inevitable. This is imminent. So this is the same case however we get here. The body is now recognised as Johnny's, and should V take it back, they'll only live for six more months, give or take. In Johnny's figurative hands though, life will be indefinite. And prior to Phantom Liberty, that really was the only way, other than entering Makoshi with Arasaka, to kind of survive. V of course doesn't die either, but rather crosses the bridge with Alt to become part of some higher entity beyond the Black Wall. Though that's all part of the temperance ending that will come to as its own thing next. However, this is definitely not the path by which I would recommend obtaining temperance. You see, in this ending, and this ending alone, we have to make the decision as the consciousness of Silverhand, who can do whatever the hell he wants in this scenario. And one could argue, depending on Johnny and V's pre-existing relationship, that this is the darkest of all endings, should Johnny keep the body. Know what? I couldn't give a pig's prick what you think. I stay, you fuck off, that's the deal. You lying sack of shit. What do I do, Alden? In this scenario, the story of Cyberpunk becomes twisted, contorted from a tale of a merc who struggles against all odds to save their own life, to the story of a trickster, who goads an unsuspecting victim before stealing their body and confining their soul to an unwanted oblivion. I don't think it's possible to be more of a straight up asshole than this, and it does tap into the worst elements of Johnny's character, though gotta say, really cool that it exists. But if Johnny does the honourable thing and relinquishes their hold on the body, the two part ways, and we return to the land of the living, for now at least. V inherits the afterlife from Rogue, as well as an awesome penthouse just across from the mega building apartments. The same one, in fact, inhabited by David and Lucy in Edge Runners. Now, provided you called a love interest when up on the roof, they'll now be living here with you. But by the morning we wake up, Judy, or Pan Am, will have resorted to leave Night City for their own sake, whilst River and Kerry alternatively vow to stick around and wait for you. 
you. Basically, if you allow all your decisions to be guided by the romance options and your 90% of this poll, this ain't gonna be the ending for you. If you're big into a blaze of glory though, and hunt around this place some before hopping in the Delamaine AV, you'll learn that V is carefully preparing for the space-based heist of this new short-lived lifetime. There's seriously so much info on space around here, it warrants its own lore video, but suffice to say it's good for shadowing. Delamaine then explains on the way to the afterlife that Arasaka was utterly crippled by the destruction of Makoshi, and knowing what we know about Yorinobu, I'd wager he'd actually be chuffed about this. The remnants of his father have been cast into the void, and even if he still gets ousted in two years, it'll only mean getting replaced by someone like Michiko, not literally replaced with his tyrannical father. Arriving at the afterlife though, things are a little somber. Rogue is, after all, still dead, and it's likely will be gone soon too. The fate of the afterlife in this case is unclear, but overall this one ends on a massive note of hope, after our fateful meeting with Mr. Blue Eyes. Look, this guy is the most enigmatic of all characters in this game, showing up during the disturbing Dream On and the Killing Moon with clear connections to Night Corp, who appear hellbent on mind controlling the populace for their quote unquote own good. Their resources are unknown but seemingly limitless, and when Mr. B says he can actually further help us, I wanna believe him. After all, who else is there to turn to now? Arasaka and the NUSA both exacted tolls too heavy, and this next stunt appears arguably tougher than even Arasaka Tower. A shame, really, that we never get to experience it. But hey, maybe it'll be a badass way to kick off the next game. We can only hope. An anti-gravity fight through the Crystal Palace would be one hell of a bang to start on after all. But for now, it merely serves as a cliffhanger ending and the blaze of glory foreshadowed through the game. Except there's a way to reach it, tougher for Defo, but one which doesn't mean Rogue's death. And we'll come back to that after this. Temperance is of course the ending where we make the cold, logical choice. With an indefinite lifespan far exceeding our own, it does make sense that Johnny should receive V's body. It's neither fair nor just, but does allow both of us definitively to live on for as long as possible. It's also the name of the tarot card found at the Columbarium, representing a mature state of equilibrium, self-control, and inner peace. Doesn't sound too bad to me. Clearly the animalistic desire to survive is strong, rightfully so, but remove that and this choice is purely logical. It can be achieved, of course, via the sun ending, which we just covered, Don't Fear the Reaper or the Star, both of which we'll cover next. However you get there though, events play out more or less the same. Johnny awakens in a small apartment of West Wind Estates on his final day in Night City. He then recruits Steve, a kid from across the hall, to be his driver for the day, rewarding him handsomely at the end. This ending definitely feels more grounded than the others, and not necessarily in a good way. V has given their life, of course, to the equation that Johnny's will be longer, and thus far, the guy doesn't seem to have spent it that meaningfully. But the chat we have with Steve in the car, an accomplished musician imparting some grounded wisdom to an aspiring one, well, it may not be world-changing, earth-shattering bucket loads of good, but it's a clear net positive. And the visit to the guitar store is just one of the most wholesome moments we get in this game, buying one of the highest quality guitars in the store, only to gift it to the kit. Sort of an opportunity for Johnny to pass down his musical legacy, I suppose. And who knows, maybe we'll hear Steve on the radio in Cyberpunk Orion. Anyway, with a visit finally to the Columbarium, Johnny purchases a plaque for V, placing inside the bullet pendant present in every ending, and if we went by way of the sun, one for Rogue as well. Then, just like that, Johnny boards a bus, leaving his guitar to Steve without a word, and leaves Night City for God knows what. Haven't forgotten a thing. Never will. It would be a better, more hopeful ending, but then the voicemails come in, and it becomes clear that Johnny did indeed leave most of V's friends, wondering just what happened to them, with Judy being the most confused and tragic. Stay safe. Call me when you hear this. Here's to hoping she moves across the country and marries someone else, because, you know, that's what she did in other timelines. It really is bittersweet, this one. In a similar way, I suppose, to the tower, it's kind of an inverted version of that, only I'd say the tower is more on the bitter side, whereas temperance is indeed perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Sad, but hopeful. Of course, if you're going this perfectly justified route, there is only one of the three ending paths I think is really worth taking for getting here. Doing it via the 
the sun means Rogue died for nothing. Johnny would have inevitably taken over the body anyway, even though that's not an ending. Though I do suppose V gets access to a digital afterlife this way. But no, rather the best path for this is where we've put nobody else in harm's way and are entirely at liberty to do whatever we damn well please. Don't Fear the Reaper is the secret ending to Cyberpunk 2077 and voted by you guys, I think, to be the best. I'm gonna humbly disagree and call it second best, but that's my personal sentiment. I completely get it if you wanna swap these top two. This one is the biggest pain to access overall, though probably the most worth it. What you need to first do is during the chip in quest at the oil fields, pick the passive aggressive option to say Johnny screwed up our friendship. No Johnny, you fucked that up too. You used me. Lied to me. Can't trust you at all. Seems counterintuitive, I know, but human psychology does say that sometimes you've got to treat people like shit to make them respect you more. Sometimes. And trying harder from there on to be our friend, flash forward to the rooftop after embers and wait for a solid four minutes. Go make a drink or something, and when you come back, Silverhand should have piped up with this suggestion. Kind of tough deciding which of your friends get to die, isn't it? Good news is you got this one Chum who's already dead. And he'd be honored to join you on a wild suicide run. Unlike the Sun and Star, which require plenty of setup as well as downloading alt to a shard, this ending deals with all that off screen, cutting us straight into the action as we waltz through the front door of Arasaka Tower and just shoot our shot at getting to Mikoshi. This ending is definitely less forgiving than the alternatives, for starters death in Don't Fear the Reaper means rolling the same credits we get for Path of Least Resistance, i.e. everyone again treats us as though we just died, so really you only want to go into this with a very very well prepared build. I'd recommend my Biako Apogee one or the Satara with a Neil mod build, which I pretty much cover in Shotguns Ranked. For this one, we are entirely alone, unassisted, save for Johnny popping in as a Digighost. And the Smasher fights in particular does feel a lot harder in this ending. It may be one of the most rewarding ways to finish the game, but good luck on very hard difficulty. We also don't really get any particular unique items here, unlike the Sun and Star, but the lack of Rogue's presence does indeed save her life. After entering Makoshi, things play out much the same as they did in the sun, only this time V is in control, and whatever choice they make is going to be neither dark nor sinister. Like I say, it's Don't Fear the Reaper where we're most at liberty to make either of the two choices. Nobody else died to grant us this opportunity, and if we realise in the end that Johnny ought to be the one to live, then at least all the fighting has earned us the right to choose that, and V is in control to make the choice, not Johnny. But equally, we're well within our means to reclaim our body for ourselves, and doing so will trigger a brighter version of the sun ending, with events unfolding play by play, save for one small difference. Upon arriving at the afterlife and making the choice of who to drink to, Rogue will be present by our side, leaving just the options of Johnny, Jackie, or ourselves. In this scenario, I assume that failure at the Crystal Palace means Rogue resumes full control of the afterlife, and it's nice to know that it stays in her capable hands. Whilst the existence of Don't Fear the Reaper doesn't cheapen her death, it does make it feel a little more pointless. And aside from obtaining pride, prejudice, and the caretaker's spade, I see little canonical reason to pick that ending over this one. Again though, taking on Arasaka Tower by oneself does come at a cost, and you'll certainly be in for a greater challenge if choosing to do so. So finally, the number one best ending to Cyberpunk 2077, in my humble opinion, is the star. I'm well aware that not everybody will agree with me on this, but still, hear me out. The Aldecaldo ending can only be unlocked, of course, by first completing Pan Am's string of side quests, up to and including Queen of the Highway. After this, we're essentially a de facto member of the clan who'll be willing to head through hell and back to help us, quite literally, in some sense. Gonna ask Pan Am for help is the option to choose here, though Johnny does warn about putting those we care about in harm's way. A fact which, granted, is certainly a con to this ending. And whilst the events which unfold do help the Elder Caldos massively, we could argue that this is a more selfish ending than the selflessly heroic Don't Fear the Reaper, which we just looked at. Even still, a call to Pan Am, romanced or not, in the middle of the night, results in a swift pickup and a plan quickly cobbled together by the Elder Caldos. We also take the beta blockers for this ending, so no Johnny Silverhand until the end, but there are 
are a bunch of encounters to be had around the camp if you pay attention during all the prep work. V of course has to talk to alts in this scenario, and if you've completed Phantom Liberty, make sure not to miss the extra dialogue referring to our encounters with the Black Wall. It draws attention to just how powerful Somi had become, or how dangerous the Black Wall weapons from Sinusure really are. Another benefit is Cassidy Writer's shooting contest, with the victory prize being the fastest revolver in the West, Amnesty. No longer quite the best revolver by my accounts, but a very solid second. There's also Benedict and Bruce here, potentially, both of whom we would have saved during the later Badlands gigs. And finally, we get officially named a member of the Alder Caldos and awarded with a special jacket. Then spend one final, potentially romantic evening with Pan Am, leaning on each other up on this hilltop. I could sit here with you all night. I think I'd like that. Then it's on to the other most badass end mission, tied with storming through the front door in Don't Fear the Reaper. Though gotta say, storming a previously unavailable section of the map alongside an army of tarmac rats inside a ridiculously powerful hover tank is by far the most explosive and far-fetched way to do things. And interestingly, this ending also ties back to Night Corp in some way. This building project is theirs, and whilst Blue Eyes has never been sighted here, it's another opportunity to bring Night Corp to the limelight before a sequel. This whole mission feels like some Star Wars type rebellion, prevailing against all odds against a power far greater, but it's not without its own casualties. Indeed, Bob gets obliterated when hijacking the signal tower, and Teddy by an airstrike. Prominent members of the crew who were with us to steal the tank in the first place. Mitch too heroically offers himself up in a sacrificial play straight out of Pacific Rim, piloting the two-man basilisk by himself to buy us all an escape. Say Mitch nothing? is right. The three of us have still got a decent shot, but without him, they've got none. Though, spoiler alert, he at least is fine, due to his war-toughened synapses. But the same can't be said for Saul, the biggest casualty of this ending by far, who meets his demise at Adam Smasher's boot. On the top. A similar kind of death to Rogue, and one that weakens the cyborg considerably for the fight. That's after we storm Arasaka Tower from below this time, having pulled the crazy crazy stunt of burrowing under Night City to it, and yeah, again, this is more ambitiously crazy than storming through the front entrance I'd say. But once we're inside, it is a similar deal to the sun and don't fear the reaper. Fight through a couple rooms, upload alts, and watch in horror as she works her black wall magic. Then head into the same arena room Room to fight Smasher. Of course, we do have Pan Am on hand to help this time, which could be an awesome power couple destroy evil cyborg moments, depending. And again, I found it fairly straightforward on very hard, just keeping at a distance with my Satara. There's a satisfying Silver Hand sends his regards moments at the end, though no more so than any other timeline. And then it's into Makoshi, for the same body dilemma as always. And here, where I'm talking about the star ending being the best, I mean only in the eventuality that V returns to their body and everything that comes after. Giving it to Johnny here cheapens the sacrifices made by the Alder Caldos, rendering them not pointless, the raid still helps the clan massively, but it just feels a bit wrong to throw the help back in their face like that. And again, Don't Fear the Reaper is the best way to go for temperance, I think. And returning V to their body also results in this emotion-packed line that really made me well up back in December 2020 when I first played it. Goodbye, V. Stop fighting. Man, this game is good. Should V return to their body then, the decision is made off screen to leave Night City with Pan Am, eventually sneaking through the border via an old service tunnel. This is also the only ending where we hear definitively that Hanako died amidst the chaos. Sure, you're a that his sis, Hanako, was among the victims. So mark that as an outcome here, albeit one that I don't particularly care about. What does interest me though is just how she wound up dead whilst we know she was imprisoned at the Arasaka residence. I can only assume that she broke out some other way, got to the tower, and was fried by alts during our surprise attack from below. Perhaps this wouldn't happen during the Sun and Don't Fear the Reaper, as those invasions are a lot more visible, perhaps making Hanako aware to stay away. Or maybe she still does die in those and we just don't hear about it. I don't know. Now the 
absolute cherry on top that makes the star the best ending for me involves romancing Pan Am as male V or Judy as female. Arguably, Judy is the best option of all, merely adding another friend whom we get to leave Night City with, though just Pan Am and the remaining Aldecaldos ain't bad either. Again, not so great for River and Kerry fans, but knowing the majority of my audience's preference, this will be the best one for most of you guys in terms of romantic closure. Survival is one thing, glory is another, but this is the ending about family and friendship and I suppose love. Taking a step back and looking at all of these options, it's clear that a huge theme of this game is rewarding us for making friends. Indeed, all the best endings are only unlocked after forging those bonds, and this is the only real one where we keep them. A total antithesis to the Phantom Liberty Tower ending, where all is lost, and it was only after playing that one that I realised just how special the star is. It may still be choosing the quiet life in some sense, as opposed to Blaze of Glory, but it's quiet life in the best possible way. And one of two things will happen from here on. Either V will still slowly die, as seems to be the case most of the time, but they will be surrounded the whole time by the people they care about most in the world. In fact, re-watching the differing credits, it does seem the true best option here is to bring Judy along. Pan Am, despite her efforts, struggles thereafter to spend as much time with us as she'd like, what with running the clan now. Whereas Judy, well, this whole voice note is just wholesome. Yeah. I just wanted you to know that I'm happy first time in my life. This one does end on a very high note of hope, riding off into the sunset and who knows, maybe a sequel will open up a way for V to survive this. Maybe we trade with an offshoot of Biotechnica, securing a new body that can work indefinitely. Or maybe we get access to some sinusure like tech that can cure our condition. For the moment at least, this ending provides the guarantees of freedom, friendship and love, with a little pinch of hope too. Hell, even the Star Tarot itself, found at this station, is described as the car of hope, shining the path to home, backed up further by V's final words here. Well, it's perfect. All great, Pan Am. We're going home. Sure, it's not as glorious as the sun, but I feel like that's the whole point here. After all, what does glory matter in the end when there's nobody to share it with? And if I were down to my final days, I'd probably choose to spend them in the company of those I care about, rather than desperately clawing for some final shot at glory. Achieving goals for me, personally, is just never a thirst that I feel can quite be quenched, it's just an ever-revolving thing. Whilst taking a moment to just sit back and appreciate what you do have, that can be cathartic as hell, happy even. So it's not a perfect ending, the star exacts a heavy toll for sure, not least on some of those we care about, and it is a toss up between this and Don't Fear the Reaper for which is best. In the end, it all comes down to the very simple question, love or glory? Of course, if we look back along all of these endings, save suicide for a second, there is one thing I've noticed. They are mostly left open ended for V's potential survival, and I actually have a fairly solid theory as to how V can survive all of them, remaining present or maybe even still the protagonist for Cyberpunk Orion. But that of course is a theory video for another day, so subscribe if you don't want to miss it and comment below your favourite main ending of Cyberpunk 2077 and why. Massive thanks as always to my wonderful patrons for your continued support of the channel, more on that in the description. Thank you for watching, I'm Sam Brown and I'll see you in the next one.